Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Profiting Off of Conflict, Faith-Based Investors Calling for Accountability in the Defense Industry. My name is Jillian Lyon. I am a Senior Program Associate with Investor Advocates for Social Justice, and I am excited to welcome you all here today. We are joined by four fabulous guest speakers who have been leaders in peace movements and calls for corporate accountability. Again, welcome to everyone joining. Our webinar will consist of 45 minutes of presentations with a 15 minute Q&A session at the end. Please feel free to put questions in the chat as we go along or use the raise hand button during the Q&A session. And for reference, this webinar will be recorded. To briefly introduce Investor Advocates for Social Justice, we are a nonprofit organization representing faith-based institutional investors working to leverage investments to advance human rights, climate justice, racial equity, and the common good. Before we jump into our presentations, I wanted to start this webinar off with a land acknowledgement which is a formal statement that recognizes the land on which we're living and working, respecting indigenous peoples as the traditional stewards. So I am calling into you all today from Piscataway land, and we are gonna put a link in the chat if you wanna learn more about land acknowledgements or where you are calling in from. I think this is especially important as we talk about militarization and nuclear weapons, acknowledging the leadership of Black, Indigenous, and people of color in peace movements and the disparate impacts these communities are burdened with. Today, we are all viewing with heavy hearts Russia's aggression against Ukraine as oil prices soar, defense stocks are up, and US banks lobby for special considerations on sanctions. All the while, our global community faces a massive humanitarian crisis, environmental degradation, and the very real potential for nuclear detonation. The calls for peace, investor accountability, and corporate responsibility are ever more important. And in reflection to this, our speakers will be highlighting the true cost of militarization and nuclear threats, as well as putting a spotlight on the corporate actors who may be poised to profit. So without further ado, I want to introduce you to our first speaker, Bernice Gutierrez with the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. Bernice was born in Carrizozo, New Mexico in 1945, eight days before the first nuclear weapon ever was detonated at the Trinity site in New Mexico. Since then, her family has been greatly impacted by radiation exposure. After meeting Tina Cordova, co-founder of the Downwinders Consortium, she became deeply involved with the organization and now serves on the steering committee. So we are humbled to have Bernice here today. Over to you, Bernice. Oh, you're on mute, Bernice, so if you want to unmute. Thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this webinar. Uh, it's greatly, it's a great service to the, to the nation and to the world to have events like this. And as Jillian said, I was born eight days before the detonation of the first nuclear test anywhere in the world. One of my endocrinologists had asked me if my family had ever been exposed to radiation after reading my family's medical history. At the time, I had no clue, as I absolutely had no knowledge about radiation exposure or how one got it. Then one evening I was watching the local news when Tina Cordova, the co-founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium or TBDC was speaking about their organization and about an upcoming event they were having. I got on the internet, researched their organization and contacted Tina. I outlined the many cases of cancer my family had and she invited me to attend the event. I did. I got so much information that clarified and explained so much for me. Then I learned that a Radiation Exposure Compensation Act, or RECA, had been formed for the people downwind of the Nevada test site, and that they were receiving restitution for the exact same thing that New Mexicans had experienced. But for some unknown reason, New Mexico had been left out, and to the present day, almost 77 years later, is still excluded 
from receiving restitution. For the last 17 years, the goal of the TBDC has been, under the leadership of Tina Cordova, to get New Mexicans, as well as our post-1971 uranium workers, included in RICA, to get equal justice as others have already received. New Mexico has been viewed as a sacrifice zone for the nuclear industry. Not only was the first bomb tested here with no regard for the people living as close as 12 miles from the test, but there was no follow-up after the test to check on the people living in the area. As if the first nuclear test done in New Mexico wasn't enough, now go the government wants to bring high-level nuclear waste to another site close to the existing WIP site already here. We don't want any more waste brought here. This harm has caused New Mexico residents an enormous amount. My mother had three types of cancer, thyroid, skin, and breast cancer. One brother had thyroid cancer, as did his young daughter. Another brother had prostate cancer. My sister has had three recurring bouts of thyroid cancer, with each one getting worse. My youngest brother has thyroid disease, and upon the recommendation of my endocrinologist, I had my thyroid removed because I had nodules present with the potential of them becoming cancerous. Of my three children, my oldest son passed away in June 2020 from complications of a bone marrow transplant that his oncologist told him was necessary to extend his life. After having been diagnosed with MDS, a pre-leukemia condition, my daughter had thyroid cancer, a miscarriage, and a uterine cyst. Altogether, 41 members of my immediate and extended family have had radiation exposure diseases. 23 have had cancer, seven have died from it, and the rest of us live with radiation exposure diseases. The cost for New Mexico has been enormous as New Mexico is one of the poorest states in the nation, despite having two major nuclear labs. 40 7% of New Mexicans are on Medicaid. Being included in RICA would help tremendously as the restitution would allow the residents to spend the money in their communities for food, housing, or other basic necessities. It would also create recept clinics that would provide free cancer screenings that would prevent more deaths if cancer were diagnosed earlier. The government keeps saying that adding New Mexico and other exposed states in Guam to RICA would cost too much, yet our government spends $50 billion per year to maintain our current nuclear arsenal. Over the past 31 years, nuclear RICA has paid out about $2.5 billion, of which $1.2 billion was paid to downwinders. That would be less than 1% of the DOD budget. We are asking that everyone join our effort to extend and expand RICA by contacting your congressional delegates and asking them to support House Bill 5338 and Senate Bill 2798 to view the full impact, economic impact report and or to join the TBDC, go to www.trinitydownwinders.com. We are facing an urgent deadline as RICA will sunset in July 2022. If the extension and expansion of RICA is not passed before this deadline, it is likely that the people of New Mexico and other downwinders across the western U.S., along with the uranium workers, will never see the justice we so deserve. We need help and support of our efforts to encourage Congress to do the right thing for the people who are innocent victims of our government's quest for nuclear superiority. We are always open for discussion around how, how corporate America can better support us. And we hope now that this message has been shared, those discussions will take place. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bernice, for that call to action and also for sharing your personal story about your family. Next, we will be hearing from Susie Snyder. Susie is the financial sector coordinator at the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. She facilitates engagement with and by the financial sector on nuclear weapons related issues. 
Susie also coordinates the Don't Bank the Bomb project. She is an expert on nuclear weapons and somehow this feels like an understatement with over two decades experience working at the intersect between nuclear weapons and human rights. Over to you, Susie. Thank you so much. It's, um, it's always a great pleasure to, to be here and to start a session really centering ourselves where we are in the world, where, what lands that we're sitting on. I grew up in the unceded Matinecock lands and now live in the northernmost, uh, the northernmost city founded by the Romans in 250 BC. So it's, and it's good to give ourselves a sense of history this way. And I really appreciate that and appreciate that we also get a sense of family. Um, and thank you, Bernice, for bringing that to us today. Um, I'm gonna talk about nuclear weapons and, and Lockheed Martin general dynamics and PNC Bank. Um, and we can go into the slides, Jillian, if you will, please. Um, and the reason I wanna talk about these, these three is because there are uh, proposals, at, shareholder proposals at these three institutions, these three um, organizations and others will get in, into those in more detail. So I won't go very much into the proposals themselves. I'll just give some more background on why why we are doing this, why we're bringing this directly to the shareholders of these three companies. Can we go to the next slide, please? Um, it's kind of shocking how much we've seen nuclear weapons in the news the last few months, more so than I've ever seen in my two and a half decades of working on this issue. And honestly, um, as much as I've, I've been outraged by how little attention nuclear weapons has gotten, um, it's been terrifying. And it's been terrifying for me, and I work thinking about nuclear weapons on a daily basis, thinking about the impact of what nuclear weapons do, thinking about what it means if a nuclear blast happens where I live, where you live, what it means, what it meant for Bernice, for her family, to have that, that very tiny nuclear blast happen. There is an article in today's New York Times exploring the idea of a small, use of nuclear weapons. And I just want to reiterate for, for folks here, um, even the tiniest nuclear weapon in today's arsenal, weapons that are suggested to be one-tenth the size of the Hiroshima bomb, that is still massively destructive. I mean, Bernice talked about multi-generational impact from, from an explosion that was a fraction of what we saw in Hiroshima. And Hiroshima, we know, killed 100,000 in a flash of light. Even this tiny fraction of a weapon would cause damage and incinerate a dozen city blocks in a flash. And I think it's important to think about that when we think about nuclear weapons. What is it that they do? They are designed not as a counterforce to, to end an opposing an opponent's army or to end their capability to commit warfare, but as a counter value weapon. They are designed to destroy what we care about. They are designed to destroy and take away from us what we love and what we treasure. That is the purpose of nuclear weapons. And the risk of the use of nuclear weapons is higher than it has ever been. Putin threatened the use of nuclear weapons in February of this year. Russia's nuclear weapons are on higher alert than they've been and we don't know how long because the program's not very transparent. Um, and nuclear weapons are not a tool to be used in warfare. They're not helping. So although NATO is thinking, oh, hey, you know, there's a, you know, our neighbors in Ukraine, you know, I, li I live in the Netherlands, our neighbors are suffering. There's nothing we can do because we have nuclear weapons, because any action would lead to nuclear war. And that is unacceptable for anyone. And so that's why we're talking about the different things that we're talking about here today. Um, fortunately, next slide, please, we have a tool. And I helped work on this tool as did many others, 135 governments got together and negotiated a UN treaty to make nuclear weapons illegal, to make the threat that Putin issued on the 24th of February illegal. If countries like the US, like the Netherlands, like Germany were on board this treaty, if you, when Ukraine joins this treaty, they can then take Putin to the International Criminal Court because it's what he did was violating the language of this treaty. 
you need a legal jurist, a legal justification for that kind of action. And just as the, the case that was filed at the international, at the world court by Ukraine's leadership uh, against Russia for violating the convention on cluster munitions, you need these legal treaties to underpin these kind of, this kind of effects, you need them to also prevent future harms. So the UN Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, or the BAN Treaty, as I like to call it, um, um, it went into effect last January. And it prohibits, for the countries that signed on to it, development, testing, production, or manufacture of nuclear weapons. You can't give somebody weapons. You can't take their weapons. And it also prohibits any form of assistance with those prohibited acts. And that's why it is relevant in our conversation today. Uh, that's why it's relevant for next slide, please. Companies like Lockheed Martin. Because Lockheed Martin General Dynamics are deeply involved in the nuclear arms industry. In 2020, Lockheed Martin was awarded 120, almost 125 billion in weapons contracts. But of that, of that, only 2 billion was for nuclear weapons related work. I really wanna make that clear, like 2%, less than 2% of their annual turnover was related to nuclear weapons. It is not significant for the company in terms of its overall turnover. Lockheed Martin makes a lot of horrible other weapons. They are one of the largest arms manufacturers on the planet. Their job is to create tools to kill. That's what they do because that's what weapons do. But they're currently involved in, in two main nuclear weapons programs, the US Minuteman III, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile Program, and for the US and the UK, the Trident Missile Program. And those are weapons um, that can be launched and arrive at their target in about 30 minutes. Uh, so it's, a, it's pretty quick, uh, the kind of destruction that they deliver. Um, and to keep the conditions favorable, for getting these contracts. Lockheed Martin made more than 1,100 donations of varying sizes to political candidates in the 2020 election. They spent more than $15 million lobbying and they fund think tanks like Brookings Institution, Carnegie Endowment for International Peace or the Center for New American Security. Um, and they fund these think tanks so that the idea of eliminating nuclear weapons completely is like, oh, maybe that's a bridge too far. And, you know, they want to create sort of an environment that makes their product seem useful. They want to keep the market open for what they're doing. It's not Lockheed's decision what type of weapons the U.S. government or the U.K. government or you know, they sell the F-35, the Joint Strike Fighter, fighter planes, what other governments are buying but they are spending a lot of time and a lot of energy to make sure that the market is eager for their products. And they are um, very, very eager to, to profit off of conflicts. And that's what we're seeing right now. Um, shareholder calls that we've seen in just in the last couple of weeks, investor relations calls are talking, are have, are, were reported in the Hill uh, earlier this week where these weapons manufacturers are just excited about how much they're gonna make over the coming weeks, months, and years because of a crisis that is taking away lives and livelihoods. If we go to the next slide, please. General Dynamics is another one in which we filed a, a resolution and I'm so grateful to the sisters for filing this resolution. They're primarily involved in submarine launch platforms for nuclear weapons. Now, the thing is with submarines, nuclear weapons stored on submarines, nobody knows where they are. And even among allies. So, you know, France and the UK, they're, now they're buddies after hundreds of years of conflict. Now they're total buddies, right? And yet their nuclear armed submarines crashed in the North Atlantic. Thankfully, the sailors were okay. And thankfully, none of the weapons were launched but these submarines are designed to be invisible. They're designed to be constantly patrolling and they're designed to destroy something that we love, the cities, the, the situations, the, the, the society that we love within a moment. 
General Dynamics also takes kind of a hands-off approach to how it looks at law. And I wanted to raise this because it's a concern beyond their products. Um, and they only recognize very, very specific interpretations of US law. And they seem to ignore things like customary international law, human rights law, international humanitarian law. They seem to just sort of say, oh, well, if there's not something really, really precise about this in the exact jurisdiction where we're operating, it doesn't really matter. Yet that's not how international law works. We do build these norms so that we can back each other up so that you know, when a situation unfolds like we're seeing in Ukraine, for example, we have the backing to go to have, have a, a peaceful redress afterwards. So we have something that we can do that does not mean just bombing each other into smithereens. We need law to prevent war. And we need law to follow up from war, to follow up from harms, to make sure that those who are hurt get some sort of justice. That's what the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act is about. It's about giving some sense of justice to those who are harmed. It's never enough, ever, but it's a piece of that. And that's what the law gives us. If we go to the next slide, please. PNC, and I won't talk too much about this because I know Reverend Dordal is gonna go into it a little bit more, but PNC, I just wanted to throw the numbers up there. It's got 1.9 billion in financing of companies that are involved in the war industry and in the nuclear weapons industry. Yet this is just a tiny piece of their overall turnover. To get out of this industry for them, would have little or no impact on their bottom line. In fact, they could use their influence and seek to finance and engage with other companies instead, companies that might be poised to help those who, are, who have been affected by conflict, to help those who have been exposed or hurt by the development, production, and deployment of nuclear weapons. Maybe they could use those, for example, to support um, companies like BWX Technologies, which has the capability to clean up exposed environments. Nobody can do it to, perfect, to perfection, but they can make a step. They can do that. And PNC has a choice. If we can go to the next slide, please. The, and that's the thing I want to, I think I'll, I'll close with this, is that every investment is a choice. It's an opportunity. And for a lot, divesting from companies of, involved with the nuclear weapon industry, it's, it's quick, it's painless. It's a, it's a painless portfolio adjustment. But for others, they may want to engage. And engagement can give us power. You know, conversations are where change happens. So conversations that can engage Lockheed Martin to transition out of that 2% annual turnover of nuclear weapons and instead look to things like, well, I don't know, energy conversion, energy opportunities. There's a million other industries besides building weapons. Um, and there, there's a chance there. And the UN Nuclear Ban Treaty, it's creating those kind of opportunities for companies to use the expertise that they have developed in, uh, in building weapons to look at how to dismantle them, how to disarm them, how to do it safely and securely. And how do we transition into a future in which we find alternative nonviolent means to protect and enforce human rights, to protect and enhance our environment in a way that we can live sustainably for now and forevermore, um, we hope. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna close it there because I know I've gone way over my time. I'm so sorry, Jillian. And I'm, again, I'm just so extremely grateful to be with this, this amazing crew here today. Thank you all so much for all the work that you do. Thank you, Susie, so much for that landscape and also bringing it to the companies that we wanna talk about today. I think that keys in super well to our next speaker, which is Reverend Paul Dordal. He is a priest with the Apostolic Catholic Orthodox Church. Paul was a US Army chaplain with a year long combat deployment in Iraq. After getting out of the Army, he became a public anti-war activist and is now the director of Christian Alliance for Peace and coordinates the PNC Stop Banking the Bomb campaign. So over to you, Paul. 
Thank you so much, Jillian, and thank you so much uh, to the other panelists um, really in making this seminar a personal reality, right? This is not, uh, you know, something abstract. This is real. Um, even as Susie was talking about, uh, I read that article in the New York Times this morning as well, and there's a sense of uh, terror, uh, really terror that these weapons create in me and so many other people. Um, these are uh, terroristic weapons that have no other uh, use other than um, extinction. And so thank you so much uh, for all of you who've tuned in uh, as well. We, we, we can win this um, campaign. Uh, and I, I appreciate the idea of, of the campaign, you know, the international campaign for the abolition of nuclear weapons, the Stop Banking the Bomb campaign. Uh, we are on a long campaign and uh, of peace. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, we, um, next slide. Uh, started this campaign in, in 2017 uh, after a very uh, difficult time uh, planning a march. Uh, and we'd spent a lot of energy on this march uh, with uh, many different groups. And after the march, part of our debrief was to say, how do we really impact uh, the, the world uh, and locally uh, without expending so much energy on a single event? And that's when the campaign came to uh, our uh, minds. And of course, it was inspired by Molly Rush, uh, who was uh, the founder of the Thomas Merton Center and the Plowshares 8 activist, who's on the call today. And I'm so grateful to, to see her name as one of the participants. Uh, she was our inspiration. Uh, there were other campaigns out of the Thomas Merton Center. And secondly, uh, working with Susie Snyder, we had, uh, I think, maybe the first or second report, Don't Bank on the Bond report where we saw our bank, uh, Pittsburgh's bank, which that's what used to stand for, Pittsburgh National Corporation, uh, PNC Bank, once a local bank and then a regional bank and now the fifth largest bank in the country. And as uh, was shown, is invested deeply in, in, in many of the main nuclear weapons manufacturers to the tune of $1.8, $1.9 billion, which isn't a lot for the fifth largest bank, as, as Susie has rightfully said. And we've told them, what's, what's the deal here? There's something else going on. Uh, one of the things that was going on that we've we discovered was that it wasn't just 1.8 or 1.9 billion dollars up until the time PNC uh, bought out a Spanish bank and became a national bank. They were the number one investors in BlackRock, which is the number one investor in nuclear weapons. Uh, this was uh, quiet and secret because no one knows who's invested in BlackRock and State Street and Vanguard and Fidelity, all of these massive, massive holders of trillions of dollars of funds um, that are really uh, uh, coordinating a lot of this uh, nuclear um, and military industrial complex. So after our first uh, dialogue with uh, the PNC Bank uh, did not move to the place we wanted to, we started a public campaign, which has been going on now um, since 2017, over 125 direct actions, pickets, ATM flyering, banner drops. We do not stop. We have a, a crew of about 100 people here locally uh, and have done these actions all across uh, the eastern side and hopefully even expanding. Next slide, please. Uh, just recently, uh, I wanted to bring to uh, us our attention that, uh, you know, one of the things that we understand about Bill Demchak, who's the CEO of PNC Bank, he was a, a small trader at uh, uh, Bear Stearns in New York, I think JP Morgan Chase, and he was uh, one of the architects of the um, the financial breakdown in 2008 as he developed this uh, idea of derivatives, that is uh, combining bad loans with good loans uh, to make even more money, uh, for which I personally think he should have gone to jail for, but instead he was made the uh, CEO of uh, PNC Bank, which as you can see is uh, more than doubled its stock value in the last two years during the worst crisis of, uh, of our time during COVID. They're making more money than ever. How are they doing that? Well, we believe that they uh, don't want to get out of the nuclear industry or the weapons industry because that's where the money is and they're going to continue to invest until we make it clear that they can't do it anymore uh so yeah they're doing very well and um 
you know, this is something that we have to keep pressure on. Uh, as uh, Susie's group uh, noted, uh, there have been billions and billions taken out of nuclear weapons over the last year. So we're excited about that. We know we're making a difference. I've got more than anecdotal evidence that we're making a difference. And so we're excited to continue the campaign. Next slide, please. Uh, got a little uh, glitch in the slide, but I uh, did want to make that connection between PNC Bank and, uh, you know, what's happening today. Uh, right now, Lockheed Martin, uh, Martin, Northrop are all up 20%. War is a very profitable business for these uh, uh, weapons manufacturers. And so uh, let's, let's not uh, kid ourselves to think that uh, this isn't a... Uh, you know, the commodification of, of war is, is, is real. And uh, until we all gather together and work like we are today um, to continue to fight against this, uh, uh, we're going to see more and more money going into the defense budget. Uh, regardless whether Republicans in office or Democrats in office, this is going to happen unless the people of the U.S. And if we do this, uh, the world will be a safer place. It really is up for us uh, people of the United States to uh, challenge your own government uh, to uh, stop all this finance. But I put PNC in the middle there, right? Because you have uh, the companies, the corporations, the, the Lockheed Markins and the Northrop's and the defense industrial strategy for the 21st century. Who funds it? The banks, right? PNC Bank is one of those banks that the dope bank on the bomb report tells us. Uh, these companies borrow money to get the capital so that they can build these weapons and deliver them. So we've got to go after the banks. We've got to you know, follow the money, uh, right? And uh, next slide, please. And so our, our STB, uh, Stop Banking the Bomb, we're called Stop Banking the Bomb, not don't bank on the bomb because uh, that's a report and we are the campaign. Uh, but we do have four uh, foci, right? Uh, we have our direct action team, our shareholders team working closely with IASJ, Father Bernie, uh, and uh, many of our Catholic uh, uh, leaders here in the Pittsburgh area, uh, Joyce Rothermel. And our education team, we host teach-ins and, and seminars, and then our TPNW, our legislative side. Uh, again, about 90 people working on this campaign just in, in, in Pittsburgh. This can happen in every single city in the United States, small and large. This does not, I, I don't want to say it's not work, but it's not high bandwidth work when you put a team together. And so we can do this. And if you're inspired to do this, we have all the resources ready to go for you to start your own Stop Banking the Bomb campaign in your city. Just give me an email and I will get all of it to you. Uh, and uh, we can, we can um, win this one PNC bank and then win the others. Next slide, please. And so a couple of things I want to bring you to your attention. I, first, I want to have, have you sign the petition uh, and look at the names on that petition because they are from around the world. And I want your name to be on that petition as well. Uh, it's a better PNC BNK. Don't put the A in there. Some legal scholar told us that if we put PNC Bank in there, they'd sue us and cease and desist our, our petition. So we took the A out. Um, and uh, our Facebook page tells us uh, tells a lot about what's going on, keeps us all connected to the other anti-new groups around the world. Um, and as you can see, there are a lot of people. We have a lot of young people, lots of young energy uh, in this, uh, <laughs> uh, but we've got a lot of energy and I want to thank the Sisters of St. Joseph and the others who are representing our campaign to the shareholders and we are going to win. Thanks. Thank you so much, Reverend Paul. Thank you for sharing about the Stop Baking the Bomb campaign. We are excited to continue working with you. Um, Finally, we have our next speaker, Sister Nora Nash, who is the Director of Corporate Social Responsibility for her congregation, and her institution represents the proponent of sh several shareholder proposals that we've spoken about today. So Sister Nora has been a leader in this work for decades, and we are greatly humbled to have her join us today. Um, over to you, Sister Nora. Thank you, Julian. I certainly appreciate the time that I have this afternoon, but a special thank you to Bernice, to Susie, and to Paul for your passion in this work. I really believe that uh, 
we have a group here that will change the world and that's our goal. Uh, I am very, very privileged to be with you. And for several decades, members of the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, that is the ICCR, along with other active investors have enabled corporations to keep human rights as the focal point of their corporate policies. Uh, Susie, I don't see, I mean, Jillian, I don't see the first slide. Um, no, there we go. Thank you very much. Uh, our work all began uh, when we started working on the sweatshops and addressed the problem with sweatshops in the 1980s. And we look at the apparel industry. Since then, we've worked with more than 600 corporations to adopt human rights policies and help implement them throughout all aspects of company operations, whether it be apparel, cotton, mining, fracking, banking, entertainment, military, or travel. All industries have been approached. And the campaign to help more companies to adopt and implement comprehensive, transparent, and verifiable human rights policies really got a boost in June of 2011. The United Nations adopted the Ruggie Principles, the final draft known as Business and Guiding Principles on Human Rights, I call it Protect, Respect, and Remedy Framework. Several faith-based institutions, especially religious communities, took seriously their commitment to peace and nonviolence and have for decades protected and participated in actions against the use of all sorts of military weapons and their impact on human communities and the environment. Military weapons of any sort do not serve the common good. Our sisters, and I'm sure many of you on the call today, have been at sites in Wyoming, Colorado, King of Prussia, the School of the Americas, to name a few. Uh, every Good Friday, there's a Lockheed Martin protest at King of Prussia, which is one of the largest malls in Philly. And right next to King of Prussia is a huge Lockheed Martin facility. So it's a Good Friday activity by the Brandywine Peace community. And uh, I have certainly a, a great memory of my protests of many years at the School of the Americas. And I have a banner activity. I make it a very banner activity because I have an FBI letter that tells me that if I ever come back, I'll be arrested, fined, and jailed. So I haven't been back up to this point. Uh, slide two. I have been working with other faith-based investors to enable DOD. Uh, I guess slide two, we're talking about the role of faith-based organizations. And what I have here is a very strong statement from the Sisters of St. Francis. We, the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia, believe that any nation seeking peace cannot support war. War goes against the truth of our faith and the truth of our humanity. War destroys what it claims to defend the dignity of life and the freedom of human beings. You can find the fact that we do have what we call a corporate stand on war. This present document was drafted for the Iraq war in 2003 and at the present time is being updated for, today, for today's needs. We welcome you to go to the website for that purpose. Uh, next slide, please. One of the big questions has been, what is the role of the faith-based organization? And so we are a faith-based organization and the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia are definitely committed to peace, because that's what our whole founding stands for, 
we have the peace pit prayer of St. Francis and all through our history, we are to walk in peace. So as sisters of St. Francis, one of the major aspects of our ministry is to educate and to form consciences. So throughout our history, we have helped to form conscious and consciences. And we do contribute to the public policy debate. As Paul said, that is the important aspect of their work. It's also the important aspect of our work. We look at military spending and we look at the lobbying in DC and we know that we must contribute locally to the public policy debate. And we must also contribute to be very, very vocal about the problems that we see today. Why is it that this morning's paper tells us that the United States does not have money for the next coronavirus number four vaccination. Why? Because we're spending it on military weapons. And so we have moral concerns here that our government and our DOD contractors, our banks, and all the institutions who actually are facing a world without peace haven't gotten to realize that. So we have to keep speaking to these companies and be the moral conscience for these companies and work toward a cessation of armed hostility on the streets and globally. And we certainly know what that means here in places like Philadelphia, where there are several people killed each night for no particular reason, but we have guns on the street. And we have companies that we work with like Lockheed Martin, but we also have the gun industry, which we should be adding in here. We're going through a major struggle right now with Sturm Ruger because they will not accept many aspects of the human rights document. So as we look at our role as faith-based investors, we are demanding that justice is a constituent element of everything that we believe in and everybody in this world needs justice. Uh, next slide, please. And so since 2012, I've been working with other faith-based investors who are engaged and have engaged DOD contractors to adopt and implement a human rights policy, but a comprehensive and meaningful one. And I give a, have to recognize special credit to Sister Valerie Heinen for her leadership in this area for many, many years. Also, I recognize uh, people who may be on the call today, like Barbara Ayers and Barbara Jennings and Pat Daly and uh, Mary Ellen Gondek, who worked with all of these military companies. Our faith and our moral conviction gave us the courage to challenge Boeing, to challenge Raytheon, to challenge Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman and United Technologies and several others. And we continue to do so. I could talk about this for a long time, but I know my time doesn't permit me. I will specifically say that it took from 2013 to 2019 for Northrop Grumman to develop a pretty decent human rights policy but we still haven't gotten them to do a human rights impact assessment or racial equity audit, but we will, we will not give up. And next slide, please. So given the nature of the company's business, it is likely that it may cause or contribute to human rights violations. We believe the company should identify and assess its human rights impacts whether due to the nature of the product or the customer. So it may take steps, it may take steps to address them and prioritize actions to reduce risks or harms. And uh, I'd like you to just quickly go through these because of time elements. Uh, conducting a human rights impact assessment would enable the company to demonstrate effective risk identification and management, as well as being accountable to its shareholders and American citizens and the world at large. 
Uh, next slide, please. I dare to say that all religious communities and faith communities have some sort of restricted list to make sure that there are no profits from war and they are in compliance with faith-based community. As you know, we hold the minimum of $2,000 shares in each one. And uh, we do make profit, but what I do is put that back into the shareholder advocacy uh, purposes. And it may even be enough to get another company involved. Profiting off of conflict would be totally against our faith-based spirituality. I think that is so important for us to recognize. Our spirituality calls us, number one, to peace, contemplation, reflection, humility, uh, and I could list a whole lot of others. So maybe that's a statement you want to think about today and promote. What is your spirituality and how do you see yourself involved and being very vocal about the profiting off of conflict. Excessive material spending robs all of us of our ability to participate actively in the economic, social, political, and cultural life of society. Uh, I've heard from people from Europe. Europe right now is absolutely scared because of what is happening. And that is because of excessive military spending on all sides. So just know also that our rights have been violated by all the biometric and biographical data. It has certainly affected our human rights. And we are very concerned about it. We must continue to challenge companies to be more conscious of their risks and uh, Jillian, next slide, please. And again, I won't go through each of these because of the time elements. And also uh, let you know that we can't proclaim that we have been successful in our endeavors. But these companies do respect us. They respect our faith. They respect our integrity. They respect our honesty and sense of justice. So I think that though it's very discouraging that there are times when we get them to say, that, yes, they will do something and whatever the something they do will be very, very helpful. And the last slide uh, I think tells us what it's all about. And so I thank you for allowing me to be part of this panel today. And I hope that we go forward with a passion and justice and a sense of community for all. Thank you so much, Sister Nora, um, for prompting such a power reflection, powerful reflection around this work. Before we head to the Q&A session, I am going to give a speedy overview of those three shareholder proposals that are going to a vote in the next month with General Dynamics, Lockheed Martin, and PNC Bank. As Sister Nora laid out, faith-based investors hold a minimum amount of shares in a company so that we're able to engage the companies use these proposals to push them and improve their human rights practices. So the first proposal is at General Dynamics and investors are asking for a report on human rights due diligence. Some prominent concerns include arms sales to states connected to human rights violations and potential war crimes, including in Saudi Arabia, Israel, Bahrain, and the United Arab Emirates. Notably, a component manufactured by General Dynamics was linked to a 2018 school bus bombing in Yemen, which has been recognized as a war crime. The next proposal at Lockheed Martin will go to a vote on April 21st, and investors are asking for a human rights impact assessment. International human rights organizations have linked Lockheed Martin weaponry to civilian deaths in conflict affected areas, to potential war crimes and violations of humanitarian law in Yemen. 
as with general dynamics, investors lack evidence of effective due diligence to manage these human rights risks, which include controversial arms sales, nuclear weapons, and toxic pollutant contamination. And then the final proposal with PNC will go to a vote on April 27th and asks for the company to assess the effectiveness of its risk management associated with financing the nuclear weapons industry. No matter how small the financing is, PNC is exposed to significant risk through these investments. This is not to mention the unprecedented nuclear threat we are living under, and to highlight once again that nuclear weapons are now illegal under international law. That wraps up our presentations for today. I would like to invite you all now to put your questions in the chat or to raise your hand and I will call on you and unmute you. Thank you to our amazing panelists who have shared their inspirational work and personal stories. I am humbled to be part of a group with so many powerful peace leaders and hope we're able to keep the momentum of this work going. So with that, I've finished um, sharing my screen and I believe that we already have a question in the chat that might be directed towards Sister Nora. It's from Joe Atwood who asks, what is it you expect from an organization such as Lockheed when they express commitments for respecting human rights? What changes would you like them to implement in terms of weapons development and sales? So Sister Nora, maybe if anyone else has comments on that. Uh, yes, I certainly believe that we have expectations and our expectations are first that they begin to look seriously at the risks, the risks to humanity, and that they begin to cut back on their spending. I also cannot forget that this is the United States. Lockheed Martin is doing what the government wants them to do. And there is the difficulty when we get to spending and we get to discussions and we get to the impact assessment, they basically tell us they're doing what their client wants them to do. And their major client is the United States government. So I think beyond Lockheed Martin, we have a serious responsibility to be in contact with our congressional leaders who today seem to have fallen off the moral compass many times pay no respect to the fact that this is a nation of peace and we are the ones challenged. Therefore, Lockheed Martin is getting away with what the government is telling them they want. And uh, we have brought that up because they, they cut us off when we talk about their cutbacks. Uh, they go to the idea that it's their client who has asked. Thanks so much, Sister Dora. Susie, if you want to comment on that. I agree with, uh, with everything Sister Nora has said here. Absolutely. Um, and I think that one of the things I would really like to see happen through this process is for Lockheed to give a plan. So the human rights impact assessment is to say, OK, we recognize there's a problem. Now here's also our plan. It's our corporate responsibility to have a plan to change that. And within that plan, there are certain steps they can take. Stop producing weapons that are prohibited by international law. They can stop selling weapons to regimes that are using those weapons to commit grave human rights abuses that suppress fundamental freedoms of, of the press, rights to assemble, women's rights. Lockheed Martin is, is terrible at this. Um, so is Northrop Grumman. Despite what the US specific legislation says, these are norms that exist within the world. We do not sell weapons to human rights abusers. That's just, it's just one of those basic things. And I'd like to see, you know, I know they're not gonna, they're not gonna change today, but they can develop a plan. Mm -hmm. And that is part of what this process is about. What's the plan to do better? So they can. Thanks. Thanks so much, Susie. Before we go to our next question, just a housekeeping item. Um, the recording for this webinar and the slides will be sent out afterwards. 
Um, but I see we have a question from Tom McKinney that maybe is going to Susie or Paul or anyone else who wants to respond asking about the slide that shows the defense contractors that PNC provides financing for. Lockheed Martin was not listed. What bank slash financial institutions provide their financing? Yeah, thank you, Susie, for putting that in the uh, chat. The Don't Bank on the Bomb uh, uh, report uh, lists not only uh, by company, but also by financial institution. Um, uh, and Lockheed Martin may not be on the report for PNC this round. Uh, and one of the reasons you might see them move around a bit sometimes from year to year is because a lot of what these banks are providing are loans uh, to these companies. So they have the capital to begin their investments and those loans have a term. So if Lockheed Martin's not on this year's PNC report, it's quite possible without what we're asking for an institutional policy against investments that you'll see them and others. Uh, so um, yeah, that's probably the only reason why Lockheed Martin's not on this year's report because that loan came to fruition. They haven't gotten a new loan yet from PNC. Great, and thanks Susie for putting those resources in the chat. Um, we have a, another question from Richard Lawton asking as ESG environmental and social governance continues to develop and become adopted more broadly, to what degree is profiting from conflict integrated into ESG metrics? Is it also important for faith-based investors to engage in influencing ESG for the same purposes as well? So open to anyone who wants to take that question. Ooh, ooh. I would love to jump in on this, if you don't mind. The, so I live within the EU and the EU is developing sort of criteria. How do you do ESG? What's our common understanding of it? So they've got some, some shared agreements around the E, the environment part, um, which are being challenged because some things are questionable um, and there's a lot of concern about greenwashing um, and weapons falls into the S, into the social component of this. And since last November, there's been a huge pushback from the defense sector across Europe and the defense lobbying institutions and, and um, agencies uh, with op-eds running, like coordinated op-eds running in multiple countries on the same days, saying that, of course, we need weapons to protect human rights. And so, and now that's, that's elevating even further. And there's a big push saying, well, we have to have lots of investment. Weapons, of course, are, are important to protect human rights um, and to ensure human rights. And we're seeing that come up and up and up. But fortunately, there are a lot of shareholders and a lot of financial institutions that are saying, no, unacceptable. And they too are pushing back. Um, and there's a European alliance, the Shareholders for Change comprised of a lot of different banks, ethical banks, and they have been just pumping information out left, right, and center saying, no, this is not acceptable. This is not okay. We cannot assume good faith from the defense sector. And I think that's really important. And I think as we see more and more ESG um, criteria come forward, we really have to look a little bit deeper than the ESG labels because we need to understand that, it, that any investments do match our own values. And it can be difficult. And you know, this is why investor advisor, advisors are out there um, is to help us navigate those waters. But um, there's a lot of greenwashing happening um, and it's gonna become more and more uh, as we see it being, becoming more popular. Um, but every fund has options. Every fund has options to exclude weapons, all types of weapons. And as we direct our investments in that, those places, they become more popular and they become the norm. Um, and so I just wanted to, to throw in from a, from a European perspective, and I know there's been a lot of issues across, uh, across the US on this as well. And thanks, thanks for the very good question. Great. Well, seeing that we are at the hour, I wanted to again thank our fabulous panelists for bringing both their personal stories and their amazing activism to this group. Thank you to all of the attendees who tuned in. I will be sure to follow up with the webinar recording slides and happy to coordinate any additional outreach or follow up 
Again, thank you to everyone for joining. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you very much for organizing, Jillian. We really appreciate it. Yes. Thank you all so much.